that we will get our listeners out from them. What is your key quote for us to help you? Oh. Uh, so I really hope that I can get at least one person to spread kind of the, the Picardo that we have today past yourselves. Because there's no point in just holding on to this more of this knowledge uh, for yourself. And I feel like everybody here is kind of as I was saying, being the professional hippies. Um, and, uh, so hippies are really good at talking to people. So please use your waha, use your, use your words, and spread this message as far as possible because uh, the more people that know about these things, the more people that can do something about it, and hopefully we can uh, inspire somebody to take a little effort and, and do something about it. So go for that. Um, and are you a professional hippie? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah, um, so Liam and I, I have been living without a rubbish bin for almost eight years now, and so that's kind of how we've come into this space, um, like really on the ground kind of application of things. But I guess what I would really hope that people would get out of this talk and also all of us, what we can sort of think about today, is just the complexity of plastic pollution and that it's just understanding the different ways that it is a problem um, beyond what we might immediately think but also thinking about what are the most effective things we can do to mitigate plastic pollution in our own lives, in our communities, and at um, sort of government, central, local government level. So, um, and how to see past sort of greenwash and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's so tricky. Um, now, Jackie, I didn't get to do much of an intro on you, so if you mm -hmm. don't mind just letting us know a little bit more about you and, and then also your key for this. Yeah, I mean, I, I did do a presentation earlier, but my name is Jack Nunez. I come from the United States. I um, lived 22 years in Santa Cruz, California. I've always had um, seasonal jobs uh, working outside, kayak guide, river guide. Um, like I said in my presentation, I was pretty uh, political. I voted the barely. Um, didn't really believe in the system. I just felt taking people out in nature was the best way to get people to fall in love with it protected. Um, but I got to a point um, where everywhere I went, it was crap. And so I decided to go from being a slacker and I created the most, it turned out to be the most slacktivist movement with the, the last plastic straw. And um, I was actually asking people to do less. And um, surf straws on request, you know, less consumption, less waste. But also, the, the, that was the, the hook and the gateway issue. But it really was the thing to try to get people to uh, just really think about seeing these plastics in a different way. It's literally in front of our noses, but we've got so desensitized on it. Yeah. Uh, it really comes down to wants versus Less, are you asking people to do less rather than more? Less consumption, less waste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I was on the sidelines. I was starting to you know just go around and say no plastic straws. I was doing these cleanups, uh, but it got to a point where I just got overwhelmed and I wanted to do more and stop at the source. And then I got the idea of the plastic straw, and I thought that's it. You know, we can wake people up to this. Then we think about you know what we're doing. And one of my things I would say to them that really stunned them would be like. That straw, that's the classy moments in your drink that's going to outlive you in generations to come. Is that the legacy you want to leave? And, you know, and it really did come down to what some needs. And I had actually a group of, of mom waitresses tell me that they took it upon themselves to not serve straw and they didn't even ask management. But they realized it mattered how they asked. Yeah. And I think it's really important to think about. So my, my hope is really to get the messaging and, and let, empower people to really talk truth to plastic. And that's what my. Um, my mission is now is like I feel like I used to say this gateway issue. I feel like it's the key to the door once in the in the room talking about plastic. Mm -hmm. But this is the real work because it's a huge systemic change. There's a whole system that has been created around fossil fuel extraction and this whole market. They they created markets for their toxic waste byproducts, which is feeds off for our plastic that we're wrapping our food into. And they're telling us, you know, don't litter recycle. So how do we shift that narrative and, and empower ourselves to say no to this and refuse it? And, but also just, you know, for someone who, who barely voted and didn't take stock of it, I'm, I'm like at, at city council meetings now, I'm at Washington, D.C. talking, and I realize, you know, politics is not action, it's the reaction to our action. So I talk to kids all the time, and I said, you know what, you need to stand up, speak up, use your voice. Yeah. Um, so I hope with this talk that, you know, really, if I can do it, Basically, anything. Yeah, and so just to be clarified, did you say you were a lactivist or an activist? Slacktivist. 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 Slacktivist is actually a real term. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's the, 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 the official 
definition of it is someone who, um, you know, maybe shares things online or whatever, but doesn't really get active in a few And I, if, if that's the extent of your activism, please continue still doing that because you're sharing information and that's fine. But it got to a point where I just couldn't do that anymore. I didn't yeah. anymore. And when I had a, a vision and a, a, a path that I thought, all right, I think this is the way I, I stepped up. Yeah, I love that. I think I've made a bit of an activist around understanding <laughs> so yeah, so that's very, very useful. Thank you. You know, as you were cracking your um, knuckles, I was trying to stop myself from doing this. <laughs> and that's what I do to my eleven job door, which is I'm just like. thing because people don't see past the I have the thing they don't see the whole extraction manufacture disposal um, and the difficulty of plastic and the, the way that we look at it today is that everything we use functions around plastic like every like a, a perfect example is the thing that most people have up right now I'm not making fun of you your phones right like everybody's phone has some sort of plastic, and yeah, it's probably going to be leaching out microplastics into the wider whatever. 
Um, sorry, that should have been so flippant. Um, <laughs> but I think that, again, the, if you have this idea of, and this, this understanding of the entire process that goes into plastic production, consumption, uh, and then disposal, then you start to get an idea of, like, okay, cool, I can make this thing at home. I don't need, like, uh, a plastic container. I could use a beeswax rack, or I could use, I don't know, a hard kicker basket, mm. something like that. Uh, it's a real shame that as plastic so, became so ubiquitous, we lost a lot of what we call pounga uh, toku ipo, passed down knowledge, right? Mm. So a lot of, like, the abilities to sew your own clothes instead of going buying your own, buying a new set, being able to weave your own uh, pico or backpack instead of buying a new one. Um, and I think that that return to matauranga, that return to tonga toku ipo, removes a lot of that plastic from the process itself, yeah. if that makes sense. It's a long winded answer, but yeah. yeah. No, I like that because I, one of the things that you said that's important is that we have plastic in so much of what we, we need every day. So, you know, we all need a, we think that we need a <laughs> I'm pretty sure I need my phone. Uh, no, I do, I do need a phone. Um, so I can't avoid some degree of plastic. So how do we make the call on what's good plastic, important plastic, not important, damaging plastic? There, you know, you could argue with yourself all day about this, wouldn't you, Jackie? I mean, how do you get around that? Yeah, I mean, it really does come down to wants versus needs. And and so you just think about, it's just doing an old, you, your own audit on your life. Um, we, we had, you know, indigenous wisdom, and, and even in, in the United States, some of our, our um, Native American um, leaders have talked about this time that we're in right now. And it's, it's definitely, the, the Hopi talk, it talks about this time and the world that we're in is actually the time of change. And they said that unfortunately for, for humans, that's a really difficult time because what we knew to be true for us seven years ago will not be how we lived seven years from now. Mm -hmm. For the first time in human history, in their, in their um, prophecies and their speaking, that this time is it's huge. And we think about it, and they said, but the great thing about this, and I kind of think about this, and we're in this weird time continuum that, that change can happen on a dime. So things that we thought would never happen will all of a sudden just, like things we've been fighting for, so long, and, that, and I think that, I think I want everyone to realize this is that this tension that's building is because this is not working for us, <laughs> and so we are right. When you think that you're you're at the point of despair, we're at the tip. We're tipping this thing, and we can really make this make this switch. It's 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 really in our DNA, and it's how we should be living um, yeah. on this earth. It's not so extractive. We know that. We just don't. Mm. We we've been in this system that really doesn't service, and, and it was all. A, you know, manufactured literally around extraction of fossil fuel in our economy. You know, and, and here you talk, it's, it's like, I, I, I talk about like our grandmas were the original zero wasters, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And it's, then it's not like we're gonna go back, back to the dark ages. <laughs> you know, we have technology and stuff, like we could do it better, we could have a, just a better life that's mm -hmm. not dependent on all this stuff. It's all this, um, you know, packaged food with no nutrition and things like that. I mean, people who, do simplify their lives, they feel a lot better, they feel healthier. And you guys can probably attest to that, is, is you're really producing less waste, but you're also taking care of yourself and taking care of the planet, and you feel good, but you can still, you know, have your phone and, and do things, you can just, just you're, you're using your resources for good. So I always say, like, do what you can where you are, with what you have, and the time that you have. I mean, that's a, that's a big problem that they say, but, and I probably paraphrased it badly, but that's, I think really where we're at, and, and, you, and when you talk about it, you just have to meet people where they are. Yeah. And um, and one of the things I would say is just lead by example, mm -hmm. and really think what what works for you, and the things that you have to with, just figure it out. But that's really, I found that too with the straw when I finally stuck my neck out. It's I mean I'm very, you know, talkative right here and, and comfortable with this guy. But I come from a big family, and you don't have a voice. And then when you finally do have a voice, when everything, you know, all the chatter's going and you're finally talking, all of a sudden you're like put on the spot and then I find myself <laughs> like, oh no, like now I'm setting myself up. Like they're just gonna like, especially if I'm passionate about it. Yeah. My brother's sister would be like, yeah, well, you know, and I'm like, oh no. Um, and so I have, even though I'm doing this and I'm passionate about it, it was a, it was a stretch for me to yeah. make this decision to, any time I was with the group or talking with people, I was the crazy straw lady. Like I said, yeah. like, this is what I'm doing. 
And, you know, I hope you guys join me to think about it, you know, and it's just kind of this weird push that I have because I'm kind of an introverted extrovert. Like, I like to be outside in nature and I like to show people and be with people and very, you know, but I also like my, my solitude, my alone time. And, and to be you have just described my entire life <laughs> my experience with exactly. my big family yeah. as well. Exactly. So, but if you could just lead by example and, and live in your truth, I mean, people notice that. And they, yeah. I go out and just even, I, you know, I got to a point where I was saying to everybody, like, do not order straw. I've got straws for you, this and that. But, or I would just say it, you know, I don't want a straw. People look at you and you start that conversation and the waitress will say, oh, why are you asking that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Or even, you know, in the last few years, too, oh, but this is a biodegradable straw. I'm like, mm, <laughs> you want to want to go there, but no, it's not. And don't give me that straw, you know? <laughs> even paper straws, like, that's still treason. I don't need it. It's amazing how they just yep. implement it without yep. thought, eh? Yeah. yeah. Um, and you, you, I want to touch on something later on, actually, that you've raised, which is okay. this, this tipping point that we've gone into. Yeah. We think, you know, this feels like a moment of real change. Yeah. We've just seen Me Too and Black Lives Matter. And Suddenly, in Koha, you probably really notice uh, a difference in the way that our issues are mm. approached, and suddenly people mm. care more yes. and want to be engaged. And, and mm. it's been kind of shocking to me um, in the most wonderful way. But the you know the kid in me that got the bullied. The bullied and kicked off buses and yeah. followed around shot can't quite believe what's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I want to touch on that because you know the other thing that I noticed during COVID was that we, we choose inequity, and it was proven when we shut everything down and we suddenly the money flowed <laughs> and things could be taken care of, and what it showed was that we choose inequity every day. It's the choice that we make. And we, it, yeah, and we choose to keep people at the bottom, you know, certain people, but then when the right people are all in peril, and suddenly, bam, the door's open. And so you've hit on some really powerful points that have a lot of, I think, um, Power in this discussion too, you know, mm -hmm. around how we create that change for Botswana. Um, but tell us a little bit more about what um, you've been doing, Helena, in your area. Uh, you know, we've done stories on Sunday recently about soil degradation, for example, as we increase the size of mm -hmm. cities, and it's it's depressing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have any arable soil we have to grow our food. See, that's the thing, right? So we need these productive soils to stay productive so we can grow food for us. Um, but it's not just microplastics, but like every other contaminant. Like a lot of us, we don't realise that because we can't see it, it's not there. And it's until you like go to test for it and then you might realise there's like a legacy effect. So that means like 30 years later, you might realise, oh, we really stuffed up and now we're suddenly um, being hit by it. But I'm really interested and waste in general so i kind of focus on the waste and our waste so i really like um bio waste so um kind of like from human origin so i really like uh wastewater um so like the water and then the solids so like the bio solids um i really like compost um and all that kind of thing so these kind of things they're all personal so it's something that we all make but we're not really aware of it like when you have a shower or like flush the toilet, it's kind of the same as you putting your weeded bin out to the street. It just kind of goes away. Mm -hmm. So we kind of like have this mind that we know when we put our bin out, it goes to a landfill. We've kind of accepted that now. Um, but then everything else that we do in our home, we just think, oh, it's totally fine. Like surely we're not creating waste other than the wheelie bin. Um, so I'm just really interested and that and then from that kind of waste it does actually end up in the environment so when it comes to like wastewater it either goes out to sea um, or applied onto land so we're applying plastics um, from us into these different areas where there shouldn't be plastics and same with compost um, how we like we might be a little bit fooled by compostable packaging or somehow plastics will get in the compost and that's being applied to our productive soil. So uh, if you think about like the issues that um, plastics have, so the fact that they never disappear, like why are we making like products that are used for like a minute and they just never, they just never go away. Um, and when they are actually in the soil, they're like trapped from any chance of degradation, even though it would only be like a couple hundred years, but it's definitely a couple thousand now. Um, so when we're adding it to the soil, it's kind of like there, it's stopping all the other good things that we need in the soil from producing more bee 
healthy plants. So we're kind of like stabbing ourselves in the back here. It's kind of stressful. It must be quite frustrating to being a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I actually studied this, I really know what I'm talking about. And I mean, do you find people pushing back on, on your Yeah, expertise? I think a lot of people are like, but plastics are inert, so that kind of means that they're just harmless. They just kind of sit oh. there and they do nothing. But then you just need to kind of like think about like how Hannah was saying, so they're so complex. So if you think about, um, plastics are kind of like made up of, if you imagine like Lego blocks, um, but it's not just Lego blocks. They also add in like heaps of different like colours of hundreds and thousands and that kind of thing um, to make it like a sparkly Lego block. Um, and those like the sparkly bits are like the things that are sometimes really toxic. So we're making these really toxic bits of Lego, um, but it's just, yeah, people don't really realise, uh, like really nasty and that kind of thing. So there's a lot going on with those things that are so complex, um, but it's just really hard for us to like explain it in a way that everyone can understand without just like freaking out and stressing out. So what, what's the simplest explanation you've got for how damaging this is? What did you come up with? Because <laughs> um, you need it, don't you? I mean, this is really vital to get that message across. Yeah, I just think if you go back to the thought that it's just never going to go away and then that's always going to be a bad thing if something's man-made and it's got all of these nasty chemicals in it then who knows when they're going to leach out or if they're going to transform into other products which are Yeah, so it's not just going to outlive you, it's going to outlive your great, great grandchildren. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and if they're going to slowly cause effects over time as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, and affect the food that we're potentially going to eat. And, and, you know, from that Māori world view, well, that's, that's really concerning. You know, when you think about what we do with this one, who is our mother, we yeah. think about that that way. You know, if we treat our, our mother this way, would we not look after her? Would we, you know, would we leave her lying in her bed in her own waist, for example? You know? Apparently. <laughs> no, um, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, systemic issues versus personal accountability. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we hear in popular discourse is you need to stop doing this mm -hmm. because your direct actions, don't get me wrong, they probably are pretty bad. They're nowhere near as bad as the top three polluting companies globally, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of the, that discourse has to change. A lot of the understanding and a lot of the ways that we operate in it and Hate it, but a lot of the ways that we operate in our current capitalist society, uh, as I can't remember who said, but they're, they're, they're intrinsically attractive and they're intrinsically uh, different, right? And so there's no consideration of the legacy. There is only profit versus extraction versus uh, expenditure. Um, and if you were to apply a Tao Māori view, which like it's, it's always weird saying that because Māori and in Māori, it just means normal. Because the, the, first, the first person to be met by the, the colonizers was asked, uh, what are you? And he said, if I Māori, a normal man. Um, and so if you were to apply what we would call a normal worldview, um, <laughs> this idea of burying a long-lasting and essentially degrading object into, as you said, our mother, is disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. And I... I it's very easy to get trapped in that depression and that doom scroll and that uh, that that want for better. Um, and it's actually one of the reasons why I do what I do is because, like, from very early age, my mum was like, "Make a difference." Every day I'd go to school, and the last thing she'd say to me is, "Make a difference." <laughs> and I'm very fortunate to feel like I can do that every day I get out of bed. And I do it I'm almost out of spite now because of like, because <laughs> I'm like, "You guys suck. How can I make this better?" So I can prove that you suck. Empirically. <laughs> 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 Your mum said, make a Yeah, every day. I'm going to say that to my children. Yeah. It's going to drive it crazy. I mean, it drove me nuts. Because every day I was like, I'm just going to school. How am I supposed to make a difference? It's like, no, you will. It's like, oh, it's sweet. Hey, let's talk about this actually. Because, you know, I, my 11 year old, I do drive her crazy already. Because, yeah, yeah you know, she, she can't buy the lollies that she wants to buy. She wants to buy the clothes from the fast food, the fast uh, fashion chains and that sort of thing. And her father did take her out to date by a dress, which turned into two dresses. <laughs> and, um, and it was from the school that I hate the most, which I won't name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
Seagulls, which are visibly sick, mm-hmm. and you see the just the arid nature of it. It seriously looks like something out of Blade Runner. You guys see? You guys are old enough. You've seen Blade Runner. Um, sorry, that's not a comment on age. It's just <laughs> like that. Anyway, moving on. Um, yeah, she took me out to Lanthorpe, um, and then after that, she introduced me to. Uh, I was very fortunate to meet him, uh, Sam Judd, uh, and then Sam introduced me to Hayden, who then took me out on his boat, and we spent the day uh, cleaning up rubbish from the Hodak Bowl. Um, and it was active things like that that showed me the active impact that our current ways are having that got me to where I am now. So I think a lot of it is don't necessarily badger them, but give them the resources necessary to make that change in their own friend, right? So. If you can get that one kid in a friend group, who admittedly might be the weird one in the friend group, um, shout out to all the weirdos, bloody. Um, uh, if you can get that one kid in the friend group who is just like, I would rather go to a uh, Save Mart and pick up a $2 thrift, thrifted pair of jeans than go to Dress Mart and pick up something from Adidas or whatever. Not to say that, like, I'm wearing champion, so I can't talk much. But actually, no, these are from, from, from anyway, I'm getting distracted. Um, <laughs> um, but give them the, 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 the tools necessary to be the change makers, not even on a large scale, just make it small. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Start, if you can like, talk to their friends and make their friends think that it's cool to, uh, to do the thing, mm-hmm. then that influences them. Yeah, yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, any other advice from anyone else on the panel around children? What we do have a guy about kids. Tell them how it is, make them afraid. <laughs> just be realistic with them about the world. Yeah. Don't sugarcoat it. They're like, okay, this is a bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think there's validity in that. I, but I don't want to freak her out to the point of, you know, because you get the, the, the last one. Uh, fight oh, thing. Please. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And I don't want her to just freeze in the face of all that. And go, oh, Alec, it's all going to go shit. Might as well not do anything to it. Yeah. So, uh, there is, but there is something in what you say as well that we do have to be real. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not not so much kids are kind of like the bad auntie. So, um, but um, I do think that this is kind of human nature. Like, no one wants to be the first, but then no one wants to be the last, right? Mm-hmm. So I saw that even with restaurants with the last plastic straw. Like, if, if you can get some key leaders or, or, or icons in that that they look up to, yeah. to make a statement or do whatever, you know, to say, hey, I'm 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 doing this, and that's the the beauty of like the Constitution Coalition, we have a lot of notables, we have a lot of um, musicians and actors and stuff that have really uh, been with us from the beginning to, to share the messaging and even what you do, you know, like to, to, to pass that on. And if you can get, um, you know, popular culture or whatever to, to, to just kind of emulate and speak on this, um, I think that that goes a long way and then they want to be part of that. Like right now it's not cool because all their friends don't do that, but it, I think it, it is really striking when you do go, you, you got to slap some reality in it, right? I mean, I, I, I went to a recycling center, right? It was so disgusting, and I had to keep in mind myself, this is not a dump. Like, this is supposed to be sorted, like, plastic that we're supposed to do something with, and it was so filthy, and the smell was disgusting, and it was so many machines to sort this thing, and they still needed people to pick things out, it was so gross. And um, and I had to keep reminding myself the sludge coming out of there and the, and everything blowing, um, and the six seagulls and everything else. I mean that kind of thing. And, and olfactory is strong. Like that, you don't kick that smell. 
Um, it's toxic, so don't expose them too much to it. But enough. <laughs> <laughs> they can wear their mask. They'll, they'll smell through the mask. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's huge. And, and maybe you can help organize with the teacher in the school and, and, and have it in the classroom go. Right. Yeah. So that it becomes a thing and a, a teaching moment. So it's not all on you. Yes. But then they they come up with solutions and how they're going to do it. And sometimes they get really empowered and they get very creative. You, you, it always blows me away when I work with kids and what they come up with. Yeah. Um, once you, you open their eyes up to it. And, the, and they get them excited. They about. get excited and they're, yeah. I mean, they're just super creative. I mean, I have to say, too, with plastic pollution and the climate movement, those those kids, Fridays for the Future and stuff, they made that connection right away. They were out there mm -hmm. with signs saying refuse plastic. You know, I say, if you, if you refuse plastic, you use plastic, that's a form of divestment mm -hmm. from the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. They were making that connection before all of us working in this mm -hmm. in this field. Although I do remember, you know, when we had the climate strikes, and, and we talked about this earlier, that one of the things that would be thrown at these kids is, yeah, look at you sitting in your fast fashion and holding your cell phones. And some of the kids struggle to come back from from that. Yeah, they're just kids. And yeah, yeah. part of the thing. I, mean, I went to a climate thing and it drives me crazy and they're all sitting there making their, their speeches and they have their signs but then they're all like, who wants bubble tea? You know, and they're all hitting yeah. that thing and doing it like, you know, and I'm giving them my stainless steel straw. like, ah, and I get them off and they're just driving me crazy. But, so, I mean, their frontal lobe has not developed yet. You know, they're not thinking about consequences. They're just kind of going, they, they, they're, they're working on all these emotions and hormones and yeah. everything so you can't really put a lot on them but they are actually super effective and super passionate mm -hmm. and I have to say when you get kids involved and you show up to um, like the city like for us with the city council meeting or you know, council meeting um, I mean they're really nasty to each other to adults um, but they can't be that way with kids they give them all the time in the world they're so excited to have them. they're on the best behavior yeah. and when the kids sit there and look at them with their little doe eyes and say why are you including my future Oof. i mean it's huge it and because they, they can sit there and talk to us till we're blue in the face about like oh you know well it's not fiscally responsible <laughs> uh, you know that, that drives drives me crazy because we have, have gotten all these bad habits but the kids once they learn it you know like you say this is this is a turtle was a turtle eat jellyfish, this is a plastic bag, what's it look like in the water, jellyfish, end of story, they, they bring their own bag, that's it, they're done, yeah. you don't have to explain more, an adult, you're like, like oh, what about convenience, year. what about my tree bag, like, it's not yeah. Yeah. yeah, do you guys talk to kids? Well, yeah, we did, um, we <coughs> used to, going to schools, but I think, yeah, like, it, on that, I mean, I guess I don't have kids, and I, I don't really get kids, and I, there's so many, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So if we can go up that waste hierarchy in the way that we address um, waste, um, then we're eliminating all of that and we don't make the waste. Yeah. Um, so if we start with recycling as the solution, we have nowhere else to go from there except waste, plastic pollution in the environment and landfill. And so it doesn't leave us very much room and to maneuver. And in that case with recycling, how much do we recycle? Well, globally, the stats around plastics recycling is the, you know, maximum of all the plastic that's ever been created, probably 9 to 14% has been recycled. And then, has it been recycled back into the same type of product, or has it been downcycled? Because if you're not recycling it back into the same product, you're not actually reducing the demand to extract more raw materials, so you kind of yeah. like to ask what's the point. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, and but then we can get into all the other things about how complicated it is, and you've got all these different resin codes, and different councils around New Zealand to collect different yeah, that's things. That's a bit right yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I can simplify it. Um, plastic was never made to be recycled. Yeah. It never was, and because of all those reasons that she said. I mean, we have the one through seven resin codes, which I and, and it's and it's the resin codes have the international symbol for recycling around it, and the plastics industry claimed they never meant to, to mislead us that that's not recyclable. <laughs> they just wanted to highlight the resin codes so that we could see what is being recycled in our community. I, I don't even know. It. Well, I know none of it's being recycled in my community, but you know we got one through seven resin codes, but we have hundreds of thousands of different variations of that plastic. You, you add a chemical in it, and that changes the composition of it. You have to, um, it's a chemical bond, so you have to reheat it, and you, you break those bonds. Mm -hmm. So it loses its integrity, and so you need more chemicals, you need more, you know, virgin plastic. It's not a, yeah. a, a real true, it doesn't fit the definition of recycling. So plastic was never designed to be recycled. recycled. So that's a really powerful message. And it makes me wonder, too, Helen, that when we, when we create things like plastic, solution unless there's equal 
I argue, are more focused on prevention. Yeah. Um, because then that's just, it's, it's the analogy of the, of the bathtub. You know, you walk into the, the bathroom and you start mopping the floor. Well, what good is that unless you're not cleaning off that tap? Mm -hmm. You still need to clean this up, but there's no, you have no, no, mm -hmm. you know, no, no, no chance. Did you see that? Was, was it um, uh, um, out of the Uruguay um, intergovernmental meeting where uh, the UN chief said, turn the tap off on plastic? Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah we, We've been talking about that, and, and actually, I, and in my presentation earlier, I talked about um, what brought on the Global Plastics Treaty was in UNEA, and they've been trying for years to try to get people to come together to talk about a Global Plastics Treaty. And one of the most powerful things that was there was actually we had this giant plastic tap. Mm -hmm. It was lit up, then Von Wong did it, and I, I you know, talk about um, artivism and how powerful that mm -hmm. is, that the message was there, mm -hmm. the, the message was in the art. And these, these guys had to walk past it every day. They were taking pictures in front of it. It was lit up, it was beautiful at night. Yeah. But this is what they saw every day. Mm -hmm. And then this was the first time they voted on, yes, let's, let's talk about it. And it was talking about turning off this tab. What do you think about this treaty? Uh, and as a policy expert, do you think that we can get somewhere on a global treaty about plastic? I think we have to. Mm -hmm. Like plastic pollution is a transboundary issue. Like it's not like the plastic's like, oh yeah, it's just been created in New Zealand, I'm just gonna be here. Yeah, like yeah. it hangs out and the impacts of plastic are most, you know, overwhelmingly felt where injustice is, you know, mm. and so we can't not have, you know, like there are so many limitations with international law, yeah. um, and that's the same with any type of regulation. It's never going to be perfect, but gosh, it's better to have a globally binding mm. treaty than to not have one. Do and you have hope well that we will get one though? Like, you know, we're at that first, across the first hurdle, mm. but of course we now need to have the um, boundaries need to be put in place, we need to understand what the um, particulars of this treaty are going to hold. So we're at step one, and then there's lots and lots and lots of steps after that. Do you feel like we're going to get to a good place with it? Yeah, I mean, so we have in this room Associate Professor Tracia Farrelly, who's been going on and on and on about how we need a global plastic yeah. treaty for, you know, years. Yeah. And if you, so, you know, a few years ago, you know, if you to see a plastic treaty, well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, nobody really believed we'd be actually at the point where everyone's agreed, but, and actually negotiating one. Yeah. And it's got to be done in like two years. And the mandate, so before you, so you agree to do a treaty, right? And you set the mandate for the scope of what this treaty is going to cover. Like, whoa. Good mandate, really broad. Um, full life cycle of plastics, needs to look at sustainable production and consumption. It's not just focused on marine litter that we can see. Um, it's got provisions in there that has to be informed by science and that science includes indigenous knowledge systems. And this is stuff that people like Tracia, but Tina Nata as well have been fighting for and they've been going you know, to the UN and been pushing for this stuff with Pacific Island countries making the space to, to put these things forward. Oh, so yeah, in fact, there's a high ambition coalition, which is about roughly 50 states who've said we want a high ambition treaty, yeah. and the UK is one of those. The US is definitely not one of those. And um, nor is uh, yeah, big, big, country, big economies like Japan is not either, but, but you know, New Zealand is one of the high ambition coalition. Australia. Um, Australia yes, we've, so yes, there are some heavyweights there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we've just got to do what we can to really support our government, I think, uh, to support their negotiating position, to support their ambition, to support people like Tracia, um, Tina, um, and everyone else who's going and, and having these conversations. Like, mm. this is our moment, yeah, yeah. to get that. And um, there's also pushes to make sure that, because all of these negotiations have to be based on information about the impact of plastic pollution. Mm. Yeah. And there's pushes now to, to have an independent scientific working group, so it's evidence-based, industry-free science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all of this stuff, like it seems like so high level, but it's just so important. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I'm reasonably optimistic. That's good to hear. That's about really the treaty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not about chemicals <laughs> raining from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> we can get the treaty working though, and hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so, but speaking on treaties, <laughs> crowds. <laughs>
it's not exactly the best. No, um, yeah, I'm really hopeful for it. I, I, I hope so because there is a real, as you pointed out, Paul, there's a real resurgence around uh, Māori mātauranga and, and the understanding, an intrinsic kind of connection that Te Ao Māori has to Papatuan, right? Um, so I, I'm equally hopeful that there will be uh, co-governance of said policy, um, but I'm equally sceptical about it. Because like I said, history repeats itself. Uh, history doesn't repeat, but it definitely rhymes.
explained it and it was just a, a teaching and a learning and just kind of um, it's how I feel when I walk out in nature you know it just makes everything like you just feel like you belong it and we need that unifying you know believe it or not it's a very unifying voice when yeah. they speak at these at these negotiations yeah. and that's kind of the glue and that's kind of the um, the real essence that we kind of mm -hmm. this like the reverence for life and, and how we have these, these talks I think this you know we, we talked a little bit about before that when you are fearful of losing, you've said less is more, but when you are fearful that you, you may lose something by stepping into something that you don't understand, like what if I want to understand the treaty, but by doing that I will have to give up my house because maybe it was stolen from Maori, you know, or, you know then you're not going to step into that space uh, in any sort of useful way. But if you step into it understanding that actually there is uh, so much to gain, and, and really nothing to lose, you know, because you're not going to lose your house tomorrow. You're not going to lose anything. You're going to gain some understanding, and that's exciting. And, and to be more of yourself and more of who a New Zealander is, you know. I mean, everyone wins, even the favorite yeah. You know, this is a bad business model. I mean, they're based on, on an extractive, you know, finite resource. Like, this is not going to last. Yeah. And so what's happening here, you know? Yeah. It's an yeah. exciting time, as you say, revolution and, and, and change, evolution and change, evolution and change. Um, we, we really are meant to wrap up in two minutes, but would everyone, and you're welcome to leave in two minutes if you need to. If you guys are okay, can we hang out for another 10, 15 minutes? Because what would be good to do is just to throw up to you guys if you have any questions of our panelists. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I have, a, <coughs> I have a question, but first of all, I just want to maybe to you, um, Koha, because it's just so important for you to be sitting there in the space and it's really mm -hmm. kind of challenging at times to hear like about the perspectives of um, the challenges that we're facing when for us as Māori, like mm -hmm. our whole entire existence changed because of colonialism and capitalism and that is literally what the climate and, and biodiversity crisis is a result of. So there's not kind of new forms of colonialism for certain parts of it, it's all interconnected. And when you mention co-governance, it's so on with any treaty, because like treaties, Um My question was to you on about the treaty. <laughs> and like, because we've seen treaties and we've seen um, you know, world leaders sign up to different agreements and so on, and COP's been going on for 27 years with very little progress. So is there any work being done by um, the organisation that you're working for or others um, to do with ecocide and the importance of that going mm -hmm. through um, and becoming an international um, crime through the International Criminal Court mm -hmm. so that when our governments and world leaders don't uphold any treaty mm -hmm. then they can actually be taken to the International Criminal Court. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's interconnected with the money that you're doing around the treaty space? Mm -hmm. Yes, I should start by saying that like the Global Plastics Treaty is not something I'm directly working on, mm -hmm. um, and but tomorrow there will be a wānanga around the Global Plastics Treaty, which mm -hmm. is going to be led by Tracia, and I think yeah, it'd be great. If, yeah, Tracia's the knows so much more than I do. <laughs> um, but on the eco side conversation, this has been a conversation that's come up in other wānanga and other contexts, mm -hmm. um, and it's not an area that I've been working on. But mm -hmm. I think that it's a yeah. It's spot on to raise it. It's so important, and I think the other side of the eco side conversation at the international level mm -hmm. is actually domestically flipping that on its head and talking about legal personality for nature, which um, yeah, which yeah. exactly yeah. is what's yeah. happening here. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. We're leading in this, um, mm -hmm. thanks to you know the settlement process and, and what uh, Mana Fenua mm -hmm. are calling for. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a great. Um, opportunity now to think about, well, you know, like the Whanganui River has legal personality, so mm -hmm. what does that mean if we've yeah. got plastic pollution in that river? Like, mm -hmm. So thinking about, yeah, I think there's, yeah, the eco-side conversation is one, but then there's a <coughs> real positive thing around giving nature legal personality and what can we do with that conversation going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they're trying to include into the eco-side um, like conversations around making it into a law, and I 
think all of the plastic that's been produced should be dumped onto all of the golf courses and mansion walls and leave them to deal with it. Um, but yeah, just awesome panel. Um, yeah, really cool portable from all of you. Thank you. I want to throw it to you guys, the conversation that we were having at the end of my talk today about, like, you know, there's no alternative to plastic that we know is, you know, it's not, it's not about paper straws and, you know, plastic-free cups and all of that, they all have problems as well, so, you know, how can we look to the future, like, what kind of future does it look like, and let's say, let's look at day, let's just say somewhere really close to 2035. You know, where can we get to, how do we get there, just like, I don't know if anyone has anything to add, or like, we've had a really hard day, so maybe like, <laughs> some positive, the case for hard in the sky, yeah. well yeah, like, something we can, we can all hope for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the silver linings of COVID is like, you know, we had this big disruption in, in our day to day, and we were actually able to see how much waste we were putting out on the first side every day. So it got shifted. It wasn't just going away. We were seeing it go into like, ooh. Um, and people were actually somewhat consuming more and more packaging um, coming from what they ordered and stuff. Um, so it was a real eye-opener for a lot of people to see it was up. I think our waste generation was up like 30%, like mm -hmm. what ha usually happens in the holidays. Um, so what was happening actually interestingly is people were researching the most, like how to be more sustainable, how whatever. People were learning how to do stuff on their own. Um, but one of the things that you know we, we talk about is to to shift that perception is, is towards reuse as much as possible. But also in this, this time, I mean, we are in a global emergency, and when was the last time we really had to, this whole war, right? And they had, I don't like to be, you know, have a retro campaign like we had waste not, want not, right? We were conserving things for the war effort. And I don't like war analogies, you know, for things like this. Um, but I do like the fact that, you know, we did all kind of come together for the benefit of the, for the good or for the cause. Um, and I, I do uh, think about how we can do a somewhat kind of waste not, want not retro campaign along those lines. Um, we're going to be working with Plastic Free July. They work a lot with um, um, behavioral scientists and talking about um, cafe cups. And they work with, they have this, concept we're gonna next year they piloted it this year was really successful in Australia but it's bring borrow stay and um, and just think about like oh god what would it take if you just stay and enjoy your coffee cup and maybe have a conversation you know or you know bring your own or whatever so just kind of opening that up and there's a lot of like cup sharing libraries a lot of cafes that really excited and actually built build community which is kind of what we need for I mean I think a lot of these answers are going to be more regional and local and even with me, with, this, with the straws, when I started, if people asked, well, how do I do this in my community? It's like, you know your community better than I do. You know how it works, you know where, you know where the people are, the, the, the decision makers, how the flow is, what's lacking, like maybe food-wise, whatever, how can you switch it so that you're, you're more um, regenerative and resilient in your own community? And it's gonna be these, these, these systems, because that is, is how we live. I mean, that's how, really how we should be living um, and it is abundance. Everybody wins. The jobs stay local. And you know, that you're not you're not uh, going to this industrialized <laughs> shipping things from all over the world. You're, you're working with your local economy. Well, it's better for your community. It's better for you as an individual too. When you're when you're feeling well, people around you will feel well too. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that don't don't profit or don't. I mean, it's just it's the polluters, right? The 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 one percent or whatever that you want to say. Because it's actually we all kind of gain from that. And I can even argue that the Coca Cola and stuff that now that they used to have the bottling plants, they still do it in, in Mexico and stuff. But they had a system in which they actually use their glass bottles, and we took it back. And what they used to do, and you had like the milkman or whatever, like you would be creating jobs locally. They would be saving money and making money. They're not wouldn't be you know extracting so much whatever. But they have this whole model of a profit off of waste, and that's got to that's got to shift. It's kind of kind of feels like we've all just gone crazy and gone out night clubbing and we've had you know, yeah. we a, a week long party and now we've come out of it and we're kind of oh okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Our and then the dream is done again. Um so Helena is a scientist. You're hopeful. Um, I know it's almost enough for your question to ask the scientist, you know, but I mean is there a case for hope? <laughs> 
in your soul. Oh, definitely, definitely, absolutely. I think we just need to um, start listening to um, everyone. So not just the people who are like the loudest in the room as well. So as long as we like listen to everyone, um, and we can definitely change things and have healthier people and happier people.
Do it. Yeah. Just go to just look. Everybody's got a front guard. Everybody's got a bird. Mm-hmm. Who cares what Auckland Transport says? Plant it. Yeah. Okay, you can't do that necessarily for the bus route. But <laughs> my point still stands. <laughs> like, stop. It. Like, I, I get frustrated again when people say, "What planet are you leaving for your kids? What planet are you making now?" Yeah. Like, yeah. I, like, we're not gonna have kids to leave a planet to if we destroy it now. Mm. Like, I, yeah, I get over the same rhetoric happening over and over again. And what I want to see is just people getting outside. Yeah. That's the basics of it. I'm really hopeful and I'm starting to see that more than I do this work. I'm very fortunate to do this work. So that, yeah, that's what I That's easy. Get outside. Yeah. People can do that. Yeah. You can actually just go outside and less is more. Yeah. Um, from my own perspective, I I do, you know, I, I feel hope and I feel optimism because as a storyteller, um, I believe in the power of story. I believe that um, we can change our story. I, you know, I think we're seeing huge change already um, in our world that I didn't imagine would happen so quickly. So I am very hopeful that we can do the same thing with our um, environmental concerns that we are currently stepping into with our social concerns and our equity concerns. We're at only the beginning of those journeys, but I have great hope. But the other thing is that I'm probably still in my little rose-coloured specs phase because I'm still relatively early in my zero waste journey and I still feel, you know, joy from that. And I had such anxiety for years about the end of the world and my daughter might not survive to be a grandmother and all that kind of thing. And then once I started taking action, it lifted. It just went. And I don't feel anxious anymore. I feel concerned and I feel activated and I feel like I want to make change um, and I want to help, you know, m- make the change that's needed, uh, but I don't feel fearful anymore. And so I do have optimism because I recognise now that action does equal uh, joy and, you know, that, that, that it can lift anxiety and that freeze, um, flee or freeze. We've probably got time for one more question, then we're going to have to wrap it up. Can you want to tell us? speak on hope, though? <laughs> oh, you did. Sorry, sorry. Yes, too. Well, because I'm so... Well, I am hopeful, yeah. and I do think that, um, you know, change is good, and it needs to happen. Um, and, you know, we need to put our energies towards creating the future we want to be and see. Yeah. And I do think there's, there's power in the visioning of it, because there's no way we can ever get there if we can't vision it. And industries are already shifted, and they're already talking about, oh, they got the solution. They're talking about solutions, but we need to be the louder voices, or or even through actions, just doing it um, and, and and making that change. But I, I'm very hopeful. Yeah. Great. Any questions? I guess, um, as you were saying before, we are in a period of transition, and um, it's nice to see. But at the same time, I wonder, and it's something that I fight with every day in my life. It's like, how do we? put this message to that communities, to that countries that are not that privileged, because I feel that knowledge and time are a privilege. So probably some people have the privilege to have a Kiko or to have the time to sit down in a cafe, and but some people do not have it and have lots of kids, for example, and they cannot even think about these sort of things because they are in survival mode. Mm-hmm. So I wonder how, how can we pass this knowledge and this willing to do things from the individual point. I know like the policy makers, some of them could be in this room, but we are not all. So what's the middle point in there? How can we share sort of this knowledge or help out there? There's a huge inequity, like people with our food system, right? There's people living in food deserts <coughs> where all they have is what's packaged in, in, their, in their corner store, right? Um, and it's a huge inequity. So it's, I think food is a real key part of this. Um, and also the, the packaging and stuff that goes along with it. Uh, this is something that we really talk about when we talk about in the community, that really the answers are, are right there amongst the community. I come from a Hispanic uh, community, and I joke around that our grandmothers were the original zero wasters. And I have to say, uh, friends of mine from India or China, um, um, Hispanic community, the poor communities, they are reusing all the time. They don't throw, they're not wasteful in, in what they do, whether it's plastic or glass or whatever, they, they're reusing everything and they're um, doing it. I, my parents are Cuban. Uh, when I went to Cuba, they were hanging up their plastic.
paper bags. And it was really disheartening because they were reusing whatever they had. They were very um, poor. And, but then I had friends that had gone, I think, about five years ago, and they were seeing this trend because people, things were starting to open up. A lot of families were, were sending money down there. And they started seeing uh, the Cubans were starting to throw the plastic bags away and the things away because that was a, a symbol of affluence. Um, that, you know, the, 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 you know, the American or whatever, that, that influence of that. So it was really disheartening. But I think um, a lot of even the poor cultures, they are not, it's the ones that are affected the most aren't the ones that are doing all this. And they're only, you're only as good, it's not going to come down to that person. They're going to do what they can where they are. We're not, you know, bashing them or having them do that. But a lot of times they are bringing their own jar or cup or reusing things. And, and they, they don't want to do this. And what I found is that no one sets out to pollute the planet. They're just not aware and, and doing what they can with what they have. And we can't uh, go to a store without being plastic free. But we're only, I mean, we're only given what we have, right? So it's just the communities is how we, what they have. So it's part of me, part of this whole transition has to be, you know, lifting these communities. And a lot of it has to do with food sovereignty um, and the packaging and the access and um, land and clean water and mm -hmm. um, soil. Um, so it's the whole package, and um, and that's the front line, and that's really the voices that need to, that we need to. Any decision has to be with, with um, our our front line, our fence line communities. Um, There's something about understanding our own privilege too, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. We understand yeah. truly how privileged we are to be able to do the things that we can do, no matter how much we earn or, or what sort of house we live yeah. or whatever. We understand the level of our own privilege. We're going to understand the lack of privilege among others. You know, mm -hmm. we truly step into seeing who we are mm -hmm. and what we have. Um, we really should wrap up, but I oh, wanted to... Can I ask real quick? Yeah. So, uh, I want to speak domestically first, and mm -hmm. then I'd like to try and speak internationally. Mm -hmm. um, so, domestically speaking, people who are in fight, uh, uh, fight mode constantly, survival mode constantly, mm -hmm. they don't have those resources, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Basically, they need resources, first and foremost, right? They need, mm -hmm. uh, like you're saying, food sovereignty. They, a lot of the communities that I go to where these mud are there, mm -hmm. um, they are in lower, low income areas. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is to set up a community garden so that they always have something to eat. There is a part of there. There's a, there's a pantry there ready for them to go. Um, so if their basic needs, like, well, one of their basic needs is covered, then that opens the door for you to be able to educate around ways to ways to uh, reduce the amount of waste you're producing, right? Um, internationally, I think it's really unfair for countries like ours and countries like Australia and countries like the States and the UK to impose these ideas on third world nations, which is a it's an archaic term, but I don't have a better one. These poverty-stricken, uh, colon colonially riddled countries that have been at the brunt of global expansion for the past, mm -hmm. what, three, four hundred years? Mm -hmm. It's really unfair for us to sit here and say, mm -hmm. do better. Yeah. Yeah. And have no idea of reparations. Yeah. If, I think it was like, if the UK alone was first forced to pay reparations just to India, it would be something so close of like $300 trillion from the amount of wealth that they generated off, off of the back of India alone. Right? So if, if you want these impoverished countries to be able to do better, and there is this treaty that is signed, there has to be economic support, meaningful mm -hmm. economic support that goes into it. You can't expect people to do better mm -hmm. if you're fighting every day just to feed yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, that, that's the point that I want to make. Mm -hmm. And a great one. Sure. And, and uh, yeah. As a consumer, like we're citizens, and we're citizens of this planet, you know, and we, what we do today affects, you know, everyone, you know, that the breath we breathe right now, when I breathe out, it's not going to stop here, it's going to continue, it's going to be there, and it's going to around, so we're all connected. So we can so understand truly our influence when we our think about our influence, yeah. Our breath, yeah. yeah. Well, um, well, let's wrap by um, going along our panel and the key 
message you want to leave, and if you can make it 20 seconds, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just really get stuck into researching. It doesn't have to be hardcore scientific articles, but just like, just start off with Googling and go down that Wikipedia rabbit hole. Just really, <laughs> just really feed your brain. Um, mm. And then that will help make things like a lot more like clearer as well with what we need to do. So, yeah. Just, you know, be the change you want to see. I mean, really, if, if, if you, you got to clean your own house before you can clean anyone else. Not that it's on the consumer, but really kind of look at what you can do with what you have and where you're at. And um, it, it, if I learned anything, it's just, you know, learning from others and seeing where I stand and what my effect is and what I can do. And, and don't be afraid to speak up and show up and stand up for, you know, your right or other people in your community. And please get involved with your community. And yeah, I think it's like this, I'm really biting on the concept of active hope, which is about building your own hope through actions um, that respond to the horrible things we're learning about the situation we're in, but responding with that by yeah, being the change and building the future we want to see. And that doesn't just have to be in your own life. It, it, you know, it can be um, in your community, um, it can be activism, um, or advocacy, um, but yeah, it doesn't have to be on your shoulders. It's more about how you can turn whatever despair or concern you might be feeling into some sort of action um, that's building that future or the alternative we might need to be active for. Uh, <laughs> the thing that I always say when it comes to these is get angry. Because anger gets shit done. <laughs> I wouldn't be here if I wasn't pissed off about the way the world is currently. I wouldn't be as hardline as I am if I wasn't constantly pissed off with the stuff that I see all day. Right? I am hopeful, but I am so upset. Yeah. <laughs> if you can get angry about something, if you get angry about it enough, you will do something to change it. Or at least I hope you do, because otherwise it's just a spiral into depression. Which, shout out to the what's up? Um, <laughs> um, but my advice as well is uh, you don't have to do it alone. Yeah. If, if you can get outside, you got, uh, talk to one friend, talk to two friends, cool, that's three of you doing the same thing. You, the thing that we get trapped in a lot is it's personal responsibility and it's just me on my own, but it's not. You've got mates. Talk out to them. Like, start with three people. Three people really quickly becomes a community. That's, that's, that's yeah. Awesome, thank you. Well, that's that's our panel. But I can't leave the Mickey uh, Jackal, but thank you all so much for for Carlo and for your wisdom and guidance this evening, for the expertise that you have imparted, but that you have gathered um, off your own bat, you know, and in your own time and with your own heart and, and your own determination to make a difference. A huge Mickey to you all. Thank you so much, and to all of you for being here and sharing in this board it all with us. Um, thank you so much. I'm not sure about about Martin. I was still there down the line, but if you are, it's Ricky to you too for being here. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and some of the great messages have come out of here. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go home. My family's all going to go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, it is, it is often the case that the the biggest change we can make is often the easiest stuff. And so um, it's not as doesn't need to be scary as what we might think. And so I've taken a lot. Um, it is recorded, isn't it? But we can play this back. I'm going to be transcribing and you know going back over a lot of the wisdom that you guys have shared. So thank you very much to Helena, to Jackie, to Hannah, to Koha. A huge round of applause. Thank you. I just want to thank you all on behalf of Te Roto Whakapore and Parakiriho or Aotearoa Plastic Pollution Alliance. Um, yeah. I, I really wish that we had more people here to hear this wisdom. But in the, at the same time, I think we had you know, the right people in the room um, you know, to, to hear this message and to, and to ask just really the right questions, I think. So yeah, just thank you so much. Um, just a, a koha for, for all of you for, for your time. Um, these are gifts from Eco Matters. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, Rako Māori. Um, so hopefully you have 
um, something where you can, you know, make the, give, give a home yes. to these beautiful, uh, <laughs> and also some some more um, gifts. Um, yes, they are in um, paper, but so you know, please do get these bags back. If you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to uh, hang on to them, but um, thank you all so much. Um, and another round of applause. Oh yeah, real quick, I just want to link up to uh, Miriamma because she's been like mad cool. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you don't know, she's been a part of uh, Zero Waste launch for the past couple of years. She was the presenter last year. Um, and it means actually a lot being in the Zero Waste space, having somebody who is in the public eye as much as you being a part of these spaces. So I just want to link up to you. Good. Uh,